Hello, this is the uh, video lecture corresponding to Chapter 5, Sections 5.1 through 5.3 of the text Basics, Intentional Logic, uh, and Informal Fallacies, uh, ECSD, uh, Phil 10. So the topics that, well, the main topic I'm going to talk about right now is uh, informal fallacies. So Chapters 1 through 4 um, discussed primarily formal aspects of understanding arguments. And we're going to now talk about some informal uh, aspects, often called informal fallacies. I'm not a big fan of that name for reasons that will come up, but uh, this is the topic. What are informal fallacies? Well, one way to understand what's going on with informal fallacies is that they are common errors of reasoning where the problem is not a formal problem or at least not a formal problem that can be diagnosed with the tools we developed in chapters one through four. In some cases, more sophisticated formal tools might be able to address some of these, but uh, with the stuff we've developed in one through four, all of the things here count as informal fallacies, and a lot of them are gonna be informal fallacies regardless of the kind of formal tools one brings to bear on, on analyzing the argument. Now, what makes informal fallacies um, powerful? Uh, powerful in the sense that they're able to sort of mislead people effectively is that they're often related to patterns of reasoning that aren't problematic. And this is uh, something that's gonna come up uh, again and again in various examples. Um, if something was just erroneous and there was no reason to think it might be good, people probably wouldn't believe it. Um, it's because there's usually something vaguely related to that pattern of reasoning that is good or is relevant um, that would make that reasoning uh, a good piece of reasoning. That's why people get suckered in. And like I said, this is going to come up uh, quite a bit in some of the examples. I want to point these out. Well, we have two chapters in the text that are going to discuss informal fallacies. Um, and they're divided into, uh, well, chapter five and chapter six. And roughly speaking, we're gonna divide these into two different kinds of informal fallacies. For the most part, it doesn't really matter um, how they're divided. Uh, the analysis and everything is gonna work the same way. Um, but we can sort of divide them in this way. In chapter five, which is I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about in this video, uh, are fallacies of relevance. And these are, um, where there is some premise in an argument or some consideration is offered that is strictly speaking irrelevant to the conclusion. Okay, um, now you can see why that would be fallacious. Um, however, it ends up looking like a good piece of reasoning because if someone's not thinking clearly, it might seem as though that consideration is relevant. Okay. The next chapter, chapter six, we'll be talking about fallacies of weak induction. And in these cases, the, uh, the problem isn't that the considerations or the premise or premises are irrelevant completely. Um, it's a little more subtle, they are relevant. It's just that at best they provide weak inductive support for the conclusion. Uh, but they might give the impression of providing strong inductive support and thus uh, the impression of providing a good argument. So what I want to do now is start going through some examples of informal fallacies. Um, and then we'll revisit this question, uh, these issues later, um, but it'll be easier to understand what's going on once we have some examples um, under our belts. So a lot of what's going to happen in chapters five and six is gonna follow this pattern. Um, I'm gonna give you a name for an informal fallacy and a definition. And then we'll see some examples of that fallacy in action. Um, both examples that exemplify the fallacy as well as things that might look like they're examples of the fallacy but really aren't. Because it's important to be able to distinguish those. So uh, the first one we're gonna talk about is the genetic fallacy. Now, here's the definition. Genetic fallacy is committed 
when someone attempts to criticize an argument or view or theory, not by dealing with it directly, but by citing its perhaps questionable origin. Okay, so roughly, I'm, you know, I have an opponent, uh, some position I'm arguing against. Instead of arguing against that position directly, and it'll be clear what that means in a minute, instead I only make some appeal to where that position came from. Okay, for example, did you see the governor's plan for bolstering the economy? Most people don't know this, but the plan is from Sun Tzu's The Art of War. I don't think it would be a good idea to plan our economy according to ideas from a book about war. Okay, so in this passage, um, sort of thing you might hear in discussion, a political discussion or a letter to the editor or something like that, there's um, a proposal on the table. In this case, it's the governor's economic plan. Okay. And the person here writing this paragraph is trying to discredit that plan. They're trying to argue against it or convince people that it's a bad plan. Okay, now we don't know the details of the plan. We're not given those in this passage. Um, but a direct way to argue against it, whatever it is, would be to cite um, economic data, to sort of look at the argument in support of the governor's plan and point out that the reasoning is fallacious or that some of the premises are false. Um, so those would be ways of, of directly addressing the position. Okay, you are um, dealing with its data, you're dealing with its reasoning, you're dealing with the premises that are involved in supporting its conclusion and, and maybe showing they're false. Those would all be ways of, of directly addressing that None of that's going on here, okay? There's no mention of the premises. There's no mention of the reasoning. There's no mention of any of the economic principles or whether this plan's been tried before and failed. None of that. All we get is um, a statement of where it came from, okay? The origin. By the way, it's genetic fallacy because it, it deals with the genesis uh, uh, of an argument or a position. Well, you should be able to see that that's completely irrelevant, right? I mean, I could take uh, I could take a box of Scrabble chips and throw them on the ground, and you know it's unlikely, but they might spell out an economic plan, right? Just randomly, and it might be a good plan. Who knows, right? Or it might be a bad plan, but whether it's a good or bad plan would depend on the details of what the plan says, right? It, would depend on the premises, whether the premises support the conclusion, maybe some economic details of what's going on. That's what would make the plan good or bad. Where it came from um, does not matter directly um, as far as assessing the plan. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second because you might think, someone might reasonably think that it could be relevant, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But let's see. Um, uh, well, first I want to talk about um, uh, some details about how to analyze uh, informal fallacies. So now we, now we have an example of an informal fallacy, a definition, and a piece of reasoning that, that uh, commits that fallacy. So now what I want to do is backtrack a little bit and um, uh, discuss how to go about assessing informal fallacies. Okay, so you're going to get things like this on the exam, like the passage I just quoted will be on an exam. Your task is going to be, if it's multiple choice, your task is going to be to identify the informal fallacy it commits, um, if any. Sometimes one of the choices will be no fallacy, because maybe there won't be um, a fallacy in the passage. Sometimes you might have to write um, an analysis, um, a few paragraphs analyzing the passage. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But how, what's your approach? Okay, well, the first thing you need to do is ask yourself, does this passage contain an argument? Okay, not everything contains an argument, right? Some things people say aren't arguments. They're just a statement or a question or something like that. Um, how can you tell if it's an argument? Well, in the formal chapters, we could tell it was an argument because there was the word therefore and there was a conclusion. Okay, it was, it was very explicit um, in all of our examples, whether there was an argument or not. Um, in real life, it's not that easy 
Okay, and I'm, I'm gonna we're gonna see some examples um, soon where there's a passage and it's not easy to tell if there's an argument there or if you just look at what's explicitly there. There doesn't there you could say there isn't an argument because there's no conclusion or there's no therefore or something. But in many cases there really is an argument. It's just inexplicit. How do you tell if there's an argument? Well, just ask yourself: Is this passage? Um, the reasoning expressed in this passage, is it trying to persuade somebody to believe something that they possibly wouldn't believe without persuasion? Okay. Um, that's the surest way to sort of tell. Does this, is this thing trying to be persuasive uh, at all? If it is, what's the conclusion? That's the thing that it's trying to persuade somebody of, right? You can't just persuade people in general. You have to persuade them you know, that something is true or persuade them that something's a good idea, uh, that they should do something. Um, so if you think there's an argument, you ought to be able to be clear on what the conclusion is. Okay, now it might be explicitly stated, it might not be explicitly stated, right? And in many cases, it's, it's not there. And remember, in the formal chapters, everything was explicit. In real life, though, which is what we're dealing with now, often it's not explicit. Um, usually, if you're trying to figure out what the conclusion is, usually it's something that's controversial or at least something that the person expressing the passage thinks that their interlocutor might not believe on their own. Okay, people don't usually spend a lot of time trying to convince other people of things that they already believe. Okay, I don't show up in class um, at, you know, 1 p.m. when lecture starts and spend, you know, a lot of time trying to convince people that it's 1 p.m. Okay, they believe that. I don't spend a lot of time trying to convince them that they're in a lecture hall. Okay, um, so typically an argument is the conclusion is something controversial or you might think that it's something that they might, the person may not believe on their own. So let's return to this. Is there an argument? Okay, well, if there's an argument, there's a conclusion. What would the conclusion be? Well, this is already, we can see it's messier here than in the formal stuff, because if you look at the last sentence, I don't think it would be a good idea to plan our economy according to ideas from a book about war. Strictly speaking, what this is saying, what the person is saying is they're telling you something about themselves, right? I don't think this would be a good idea. Okay, um, I don't think vanilla ice cream uh, tastes as good as chocolate. Um, I don't think I get enough sleep, right? They're just, this person's just reporting on, on their own ideas about things. But clearly that's not what's going on. Really, it's close. The, what's explicitly stated is very close to what's implicit here. Um, What's implicit, the real conclusion, is that this isn't a good plan. It's not just that I don't think it's a good plan, but it, it isn't a good plan. Okay. How do you know? Well, it's sort of common sense. Okay, I'm sorry, but it's just real life. It's messy. Um, you kind of have to use your contextual knowledge and common sense knowledge sometimes. Okay. Um, so the conclusion, uh, that's about the conclusion. It may not be explicitly, it might be explicitly stated, it might not. There might be something that it's close to, the, to an explicit conclusion like there was in the passage we just read, sometimes not. What are the premises? Well, some or even all of them might not, well, I don't know about all, but certainly some of them might not be explicitly stated. Okay, again, they might be um, assumed and we'll see some examples of that. They're probably not controversial. So the whole point of an argument is I, I give you some premises that I don't think you're going to argue with. You'll probably accept. Okay, you'll take either I know you already believe them or you're prepared to take my word for it that those things are true. And then I construct an argument using those as premises where the conclusion is something I think you might not believe. You don't believe already or you wouldn't just take my word for it that it's true. So premises are probably not going to be controversial. So let's look uh, back at our, our um, example. What's the premise? Um, well, again, it's, it's 
kind of explicit. It's a little bit messy. Um, the, the key, the first one is just a, a question. Did you see the governor's plan for bolstering the economy? That's pretty much just setting up the topic, right? I want to talk about this plan or where this governor's plan is now what I'm addressing. The second sentence is where the premise is. It's a little bit implicit, right? The actual sentence says, most people don't know this, but the plan is from Sun Tzu's Art of War. Really, whether or not a lot of people know it is kind of irrelevant to the argument. The real premise here is that this plan comes from Sun Tzu's The Art of War. That's the premise. Now, the person here isn't expecting this to be controversial, okay? Um, they're expecting that they just state this, people will believe it. Um, if they don't, they can look it up if they're not sure about it. So he's not expecting to have to go through a lot of argument on this, on the premise. It's the conclusion we should reject the plan. That's where the person is kind of expecting resistance. Okay, so now that we've identified the conclusion and the premise or premises, we want to know what is the reasoning. Okay, well, let's go back to our passage. The conclusion is the plan is a bad plan. Okay. Um, we sh uh, it would be a bad idea to plan our economy according to the governor's plan, ideas from a book about war. Okay, what's the premise? Well, again, the premise has nothing to do with the plan itself, right? It's, it's reasoning or it's data or whatever. The premise is just a, a statement about where the plan came from, its genesis, okay, its origin. So you can see, once you're clear on the premise, or premises, the conclusion, and the reasoning, you can see that it fits the definition of genetic fallacy exactly. Okay, so once you've determined there's an argument, you have an idea of what the argument is, specifically what is the conclusion, what the premises are, what the reasoning is, then you can assess whether it commits the fallacy. And here, um, it clearly does. Let me remind you of the, of the definition of genetic fallacy. Genetic fallacy is committed when someone attempts to criticize an argument or view, which the passage does, right? It's criticizing the governor's plan, okay? So um, attempts to criticize an argument or, or view or theory, not by dealing with it directly, okay? Remember in the passage, there was no direct dealing with the theory. It didn't talk about its data or its premises or the details of the plan, none of that but instead citing its perhaps questionable origin. That's exactly what it did. Oh, this plan came from this book. Okay, so you can see that once you're clear on the argument, um, the premises, the conclusion, the reasoning, then you can come back and assess whether it, it uh, commits a fallacy. Okay, let's see another example. This is attributed to Ronald Reagan. Um, I've noticed that everyone who is for abortion has already been born. So let's go through our procedure. First off, is there even an argument here? Well, notice there's actually two possibilities. Okay, there's certainly nothing is stated explicitly. There's no therefore P, right? Um, there's no triple dot. Uh, there's nothing like that. If you look at it explicitly, what's going on here, it looks like he's just saying he noticed something. Okay, I've noticed that, and here's some fact I noticed, right? Everyone who's for abortion has already been born, right? Um, maybe he's just telling us, you know, about things he's noticed today, and this is, you know, one of the items on the list, right? He gets up in the morning and he says, oh, I noticed it was raining when I woke up. Um, and then I went downstairs and I noticed the milk uh, was it was spoiled and then I noticed that um, uh, Let's see I noticed that most people um, Believe the earth is round right and then I noticed everyone who's for abortions already been born, right? So you might interpret this literally as Reagan just telling you about something he noticed right another way to interpret this as he's trying to argue against abortion. He's an anti-abortion person, okay? Clearly, um, it's number two, 
in most contexts. Okay, you have to sort of bring your real world knowledge and contextual knowledge kind of to bear on this. But it seems pretty clear he's trying to argue against abortion. He's trying to discredit pro-abortion people um, and thereby sort of lend more credence to anti-abortion. But notice that's all implicit. There's no explicit conclusion here. Therefore, abortion is wrong. There's nothing like that. Okay, so this is a case where the conclusion is implicit. Okay, and in fact, um, this is the correct answer. Um, what's the premise? Okay, let's try to get clear. Now, if, if you think there's an argument, you should be able to identify what's the conclusion and what's the premise. Well, the conclusion is something like, um, it's sort of hard to say, but you can kind of get the general idea. Something along the lines of, um, the pro-abortion arguments should be discredited or should be um, disbelieved or something like that. The premise is why, or, or what's the premise for that? Why should we believe that? Well, because the arguments come from a certain group of people. What group of people? People who've already been born. Now, the reasoning is kind of weird here. Um, it might be something like, look, um, if, if you're like Reagan, here's how you might be thinking of this. Abortion is a policy that uh, commits a certain kind of violence on some people. So if you think a fetus is a real person, you think abortion is murder, and that's a kind of um, negative thing that um, uh, is, is kind of inflicted on some people, okay, the ones who are aborted. And what Reagan's pointing out here is that the people who are, are arguing in favor of abortion are the ones who are already past the stage of being of, of possibly suffering the negative consequences. They can't be killed anymore by this policy, right? So because of their situation, they're maybe less sensitive to the people who will get hurt by the policy. That's kind of like maybe what is in his mind or kind of what's behind the reasoning here, something along those lines. Now, if you're looking at this thinking, gosh, this is complicated. Um, it's, it's implicit. How would I know this? Look, this is just real world, right? The real world's messy. Um, and, you know, that's not, that's not the fault of people who try to teach logic. You know, that's the fault of people, the fault of the real world, I guess. Um, by the way, lest you think that fallacies um, are committed by, you know, exclusively one side of the political spectrum. Um, look at this example. Most of the support for tax cuts for higher tax brackets come from people who are wealthy. So clearly we should oppose these cuts. So this is exactly the same type of reasoning here, right? There's a, a position, um, tax brackets for wealthy people should be uh, uh, lowered. Okay, we should cut taxes for the higher income people. Why? Well, because the arguments in favor of that come from a certain group, namely a group that would benefit from that. In the case of abortion, it, it's not exactly a group that would benefit, it's a group that would not be harmed anymore by abortion. And here it's, well, this group um, would benefit from the, um, the policy, but it's exactly the same reasoning and it's, it's a fallacy for the same reason, right? Just because this group argues for that policy doesn't by itself mean that the policy is wrong. Okay, if the policy is wrong, it's going to be um, for reasons that have to do with the details of the policy itself. Okay, we're going to move on in a second to the next fallacy. But before I get to that, I want to address a question here. Some of you might be thinking, gosh, Rick, it sure looks like um, it's relevant. Like, for instance, look at the example right here about the, the tax brackets. Um, it sure seems like a relevant consideration that the people making these arguments are ones that would stand to benefit from this policy if it were adopted. Okay, yet you're saying it's not relevant. Um, can you help me ex understand why I still have the impression it's relevant? Well, here's, here's why, or here's what's going on here. In a case like this, let's just use this example, 
once, if you know that the people arguing in favor of a policy um, have an ulterior motive for it, as in this case, let's say, there's something about the origin that is maybe suspicious in a certain sense, right? Like you find out that the economic plan came from Scrabble chips. Okay, so there's something about the origin that, um, I don't know if suspicious is, maybe it's suspicious or whatever, but raises a question mark. What does that mean? Well, what it doesn't mean, and this is why it's a fallacy, it doesn't directly by itself mean that there's anything wrong with the plan, because that is irrelevant to the plan itself. Okay, but it does mean something. What does it mean? It means that once you learn that this is, you know, something about the origin of the plan, that it came from Scrabble chips, let's say, that might be a good reason for you to examine the plan more carefully than you would um, if, you know, than, than you would if you learned it came from an economist, let's say. Um, when you know that it came from um, uh, Scrabble chips, you might say, well, Okay, that doesn't mean it's a bad plan. I can't use the fact that it came from Scrabble chips to indicate that the plan was bad, but it does mean I'm gonna look at the plan more carefully than I would otherwise. And if, if the plan is bad, it's gonna be because of the stuff you unearthed when you did the investigation, right? It's gonna be because you discovered some premises were false or you discovered the reasoning was bad or something. But those will be the reason the plan is bad right? Not where it came from. It'll be the fact that the plan has these features, right? That you discovered when you went to examine it more carefully. Okay. So that's, hopefully that made sense. Um, I also discussed this in the textbook. Um, anyway, with that, let's move on a little bit. Okay. Um, the next fallacy coming up is ad hominem. Um, and there's going to be four versions of this that we're going to discuss. Okay, well, let me give you the general definition that covers all four versions of the ad hominem fallacy. It's committed when arguer ignores merits of his or her opponent's argument and rather makes some reference to the arguer himself or herself and assumes that this somehow discredits the argument. Now you can see already that this is sort of very similar to the genetic fallacy, right? Um, in the genetic fallacy, there was an argument, uh, there was a response to the argument based on where it came from. And that's kind of what's happening here. There's a response based on the person that's producing it. Once I've talked about the ad hominem fallacies, I'll talk about how, what the difference is between ad hominem and genetic fallacy, okay? Uh, but for now, let's just stick with ad hominem, and I'll talk about the relationship between them in just a second. Okay, so the definition, the definition of the ad hominem argument is uh, the fallacy is committed when the arguer ignores the merits of his or her opponent's argument and instead makes some reference to the arguer himself or herself. Okay, now let's look at the first version of this ad hominem abusive. This is when the arguer just verbally abuses the opponent. So one way to address your opponent is just to verbally abuse them, obviously. Okay, so example. Principal Smith says, I think your child should be held back a grade. He's younger than his classmates. The material seems to be a bit too advanced for him. So the principal here um, <clears throat> is producing an argument. What's the conclusion? Child should be held back. What are the premises? He's younger than his classmates. Material seems to be a bit too advanced. So there's consider some considerations in favor of that conclusion. Okay. Parent. Screw you, you fascist dipshit. Okay, so here you can see the parent's not addressing that argument directly at all. Right? They're not saying, oh, that reasoning doesn't hold up, or oh, wait, no, your premise is false. He's actually the same age as his classmates. Right? There's no direct uh, engagement with the argument. There's just verbal abuse um, heaped upon the, um, the opponent here. Okay, next example. This one's going to be a little more subtle. 
Pete says, have you read the new book by Amanda Hug and Kiss? Now, is, is Pete giving us an argument? Maybe. I mean, it depends on context. Um, he might just be curious as to whether someone has read a book. Um, or sometimes this is a way of suggesting that someone read a book, right? Like, um, you know, if, you're, if your spouse says, hey, have you taken out the garbage? Well, sometimes that's just a question. Sometimes it's like their way of saying, hey, you should take out the garbage, right? Even though it's phrased as a question. It depends on context and you kind of need to use your real world knowledge. Um, so let's, but let's just to say that in this context, Pete is suggesting, uh, recommending the book or suggesting that the book be read. Rick replies, are you kidding? She's dumber than a box of wet hammers. Well, this, you should think about this for a minute. So on the one hand, what's the, um, the argument is just addressing sort of the genesis of, in this case, the book, the person who wrote the book and is sort of uh, throwing some verbal abuse at this person, okay? Um, there's some, uh, you know, denigrating remarks in this case that this person is stupid. Now, you might recall, so it fits the pattern for ad hominem abusive, okay? But you might recall earlier on, I said, that part of the analysis is first you identify, you know, you do all this stuff. Is there an argument? What's the conclusion? What are the premises? Um, what's the reasoning? Does it fit the pattern of, a, of one of the fallacies? But then you need to ask a further question. Um, is it really fallacious? Okay. Now in this case, I think it's not really fallacious necessarily. Why? Well, because whether or not an author of a book is, you know, super dumb, that might be a relevant consideration to whether or not you want to read the book. Okay, compare this to this argument. Okay, um, here, even if what the, the parent is calling the um, principal um, a fascist dipshit, right? Even if that's true, right? The, the sort of content of the, of the property that the parents are attributing to the principal, um, even if it's true, that's irrelevant to whether or not your kid should be held back a grade, right? The considerations have to do with whether the material's too advanced, whether they're younger than their classmates, um, whether the principal is a fascist even if that's what the parent really meant to say, which they probably didn't, they're just using fascist as a general purpose, bad word. Um, but even if it's true, you can see that it's irrelevant, right? That's why uh, ad hominem abusive is a fallacy, right? The consideration is typically irrelevant to the conclusion. Sometimes though, the, um, the sort of, uh, whatever, the, the property of derision right? In this case, calling someone stupid. Well, that could be relevant sometimes. So you have to ask yourself, once you've identified that it fits the pattern, okay, the person's just making reference to the, the, the arguer's making reference to the person who produced an argument or position or something. They're heaping abuse upon them. So it fits the pattern of ad hominem abusive. You have to go back and then just ask yourself one final question is the abusive thing that they're saying, is it relevant or irrelevant to the conclusion? And in this case, it might be relevant. So you could make a case that this isn't a fallacy in this case. With the child being held back a grade, um, it seems that it is irrelevant. It fits the pattern and it fits the pattern and it's an irrelevant consideration. Okay. We're going to see more examples of this that will hopefully hopefully make it more clear, right? This idea of some kinds of reasoning fitting the pattern of an informal fallacy, but yet not being fallacious. This will come up uh, time and time again. Next version of the ad hominem fallacy. Ad hominem circumstantial. Uh, here's the definition. It's when the arguer, rather than addressing their opponent's argument, so again, you've got an opponent producing an argument. Um, you don't address that argument directly. 
uh, you merely point out that their opponent's circumstances, okay, typically, not always, but typically um, circumstances that produce an ulterior motive may be influencing their position. Okay, let's see an example. Um, this is from real life. So uh, before I came to UCSD, I was at University of Pittsburgh, and there was a policy where once a year, every all the faculty member had to fill out some forms detailing how they spent their time that year. Okay, and it was you know another piece of paperwork, so people didn't like it. But this this kind of um, argument came up a lot. I know that the administrator said that filling out all these forms was crucial to obtaining financial support for the university, but these forms take a lot of time. Of course, an administrator wants there to be more paperwork. Without more forms to process, they'd all be out of work. Okay, so here what's going on. On the one hand, you have an administrator or bureaucrat who's explaining why people need to fill out this paperwork. Okay, why? Well, because this paperwork is crucial for, you know, the university to be able to obtain uh, finan continued financial support from the state legislature, you know, something like that. Okay, now someone who's supposed to fill out the paperwork is responding to that position, right? And notice they're not responding directly. They're not saying, well, in fact, the state legislature doesn't care if we fill out these forms. We get the same, you know, funding anyway, right? They're not saying anything like that. So they're not, they're not addressing the actual argument. What are they doing? Instead, they're saying something about the person making the argument. They're saying something about the administrator. What are they saying? Well, they're saying, look, the administrator's job requires that there's a lot of paperwork. So the administrator has an ulterior motive for wanting the conclusion to be true. They have an ulterior motive for wanting the it to be necessary that these forms get filled out, okay? And then once the ulterior motive is pointed out, the person acts as though this discredits the original argument, okay? Which of course it doesn't, right? Um, just because someone has an ulterior motive for wanting the, a conclusion to be true doesn't mean that their argument's bad, okay? We're gonna see examples of this coming up, but um, you know, notice that you know, if if the police showed up at your house tomorrow and accused you of murder and you provided an argument as to why it couldn't be you, you could you could say something like, well, look, my conclusion is I'm not the murderer. Why? Because the murderer happened on Sunday and on Sunday I was out of town and I've got all of this proof that I was out of town. So you produce an argument why you couldn't be the murderer. Well, of course, you've got an ulterior motive for wanting that conclusion to be true, right? You won't get, you know, sent to the electric chair, right? But that doesn't mean that your argument's bad just because you have an ulterior motive for wanting the conclusion to be true or wanting people to believe the conclusion, right? So um, just because someone has an ulterior motive doesn't mean the argument's bad. If the argument's bad, it's gonna be because of it's got false premises or something along those lines. Um, let's see another example. Senator Kaholic has argued persuasively in favor of federal subsidies for dairy products. But the senator comes from Wisconsin, which has a huge dairy industry. So of course she would argue for that position. Therefore, it seems reasonable to vote the subsidies down. What's the conclusion? We should vote the subsidies down, okay? It's not we should more carefully look at the proposal because there's an ulterior motive. That might be a reasonable thing to do once you find there's an ulterior motive is look more carefully at the argument. But that's not the conclusion. The conclusion is the argument's bad. We should vote it down. Why? Well, they're merely saying something about the person who's arguing in favor of the subsidies and pointing out that this person has an ulterior motive. Okay, namely their home state has a big dairy industry that would benefit from this legislation. Okay, next example, ad hominem tu quoque. Uh, by the way, uh, the Latin on all of these ad hominem means sort of against the person or directed against the person. Um, in this case, tu quoque means 
what that means is you too or you also. Okay, and it, it'll it'll make sense once we uh, get the definition and see some examples. So here's the definition. It's when A, some person A, argues that an activity is wrong. Usually they're telling somebody else, hey, don't do some action to B. So B, you shouldn't do something. And B responds by just pointing out that A does that thing themselves. They do it, right? So that's why it's too quoquoy. Well, you do it too, right? You also. So here's an example. Um, parent says uh, to their kid, you shouldn't smoke. It's bad for your health. Okay. So, you know, conclusion, you know, you should not smoke. It's a bad idea for you to smoke. Something like that. Why? Premise? Well, it's bad for your health. Okay. So there's the parent's argument. A uh, smart ass child responds, dad, you hypocrite. You smoke three packs a day. Now this one's interesting to go through here. Um, this is an example of something that's ambiguous, okay? Because there's a couple different ways to interpret what's happening here or what the kid is trying to say. Um, if you look at it literally, what the kid is, is saying is that, look, dad's a hypocrite, okay? Conclusion, what's the kid's conclusion? Dad is a hypocrite. My father is a hypocrite. What's my premise for that? What's my reason for thinking that? Well, because um, he's telling me not to smoke, but he smokes himself. Okay, and that's pretty much the definition of hypocrite, right? That's a, that's a really good argument for calling someone a hypocrite, is pointing out that they do something that they tell other people not to do because it's a bad idea, okay? There's another way, though, to interpret what the kid is saying here. You might say, no, what the kid's conclusion is, is that it's okay for the kid to smoke. The kid is basically is trying to establish that um, it's all right if I smoke, okay? Now, notice that's a completely different conclusion. Right, the conclusion about hypocrisy, that's a conclusion about the father's, you know, psychology, his psychological state, right, whether he's a hypocrite or not. That's a psychological feature about the father, okay? The second possible conclusion is about actions that are or are not good actions for the kid to do. Completely different conclusions, right? One, they're about different people. They're about different kinds of things. One's about a psychological feature. One's about activities that are good or bad, healthy or unhealthy. So they're totally different conclusions. Um, what's the argument for the second conclusion? So suppose we think the kid's making the second argument, right? What's the, what's the argument here? Well, my dad says I shouldn't smoke, um, uh, but he smokes. Therefore, it's okay if I smoke. Well, if that's the kid's argument, if that's kind of what's in his head or how he's thinking this is supposed to go, then it's a clear ad hominem to quoque fallacy, right? He's trying to justify his own actions um, against criticism of those actions simply by pointing out that the person making the criticisms does that action themselves. And if that's the argument, it's fallacious, right? It's whether or not the dad smokes is irrelevant to whether or not it's a good idea for the kid to smoke, right? It's not like, you know, smoking is could be bad for my health, but oh, if my dad smokes, then all of a sudden, you know, the medical facts are different. Now all of a sudden smoking is good for my health, right? It's irrelevant um, that, you know, your dad also smokes uh, to the conclusion whether it's a good idea for you to smoke or not. So this is an example of a passage that's ambiguous. It could mean two different things. It depends on context. Sometimes people don't really distinguish those. That's why these are these work. Um, people kind of get mixed up in their head. They're not clear if they're making an argument about hypocrisy or about you know why a certain action is really okay for them to do. Um, but when you're analyzing these arguments, you should get clear about them. Um, now, on a test, if there's a passage like this that's ambiguous, 
um, if it's multiple choice, um, what we'll do is try to make it that only one of the choices is a possibility, right? So if it was here, um, there wouldn't be no fallacy and ad hominem to quoque, right? Though, because both of those would be possible choices, right? If you think if the argument's a argument that your dad's a hypocrite, that's not a fallacy. That's a great argument to the effect that dad's a hypocrite, okay? So that would be one possible correct answer. Ad hominem to quoque is also a possible correct answer. If that's an argument justifying smoking, that's, that's fallacious. Just pointing out that your dad smokes does not justify you smoking, okay? So since both of those are possible answers, they wouldn't both be options on a multiple choice. We would only give you one of those, and the other three would be things that couldn't possibly be right. If it's an essay question, then what you should do in a case like this is say you know, that it's ambiguous. Say, well, the passage, you know, you would write it out this way. The passage is really um, could be interpreted two ways. On one interpretation, the kid is um, just arguing that the dad is a hypocrite. And this argument is actually not fallacious at all, because whether or not the dad does things that they tell other people not to do is relevant to whether the dad's a hypocrite. Um, the other interpretation of this argument is um, the kid is trying to justify their own smoking behavior just by pointing out that the person criticizing them for that behavior does it themselves. And if that's the argument, then it commits an ad hominem to quoque fallacy. And you just write that out, right? And then the person grading it would read it and they would say, okay, this person who, uh, this exam, who wrote this exam knows what they're talking about and they would give you a lot of points. Okay, let's see another example of ad hominem to quoque. Editors of the Sacramento Bee have accused our company of being one of the worst water polluters. But the bee is responsible for more pollution than we are. They own access chemicals from whom they get their ink and dump tons of chemicals into the river every day. Same thing, it's kind of ambiguous. They didn't just come out and say, it's okay if we dump chemicals in the river. But it's probably implicit that that's what they're trying to establish. But really, all they've done is shown that this newspaper does the same thing they accuse other people of doing. So to the extent that this, the person writing this passage is trying to defend their own behavior, it's just an ad hominem to quoque fallacy. There's an example from real world. Um, the comedian Carol Burnett has filed a copyright infringement suit against the makers of Fox TV's cartoon sitcom Family Guy over an episode poking fun at the performer and her variety show from the 60s and 70s. The lawsuit um, claims that Family Guy violated Burnett's exclusive rights to her name and likeness by depicting her signature cleaning woman character in a segment last April without her consent. Um, the suit seeks $2 million in damages, says that the episode used a slightly altered version of the copyrighted musical theme without permission. Um, a spokesman for 20th Century Fox, which produces Family Guy, said on Friday the suit was without merit. References to Burnett and her show in an 18-second sequence uh, were just parody. And here's the, here's the crucial bit. Um, this is the studio spokesperson again trying to defend themselves against this claim of copyright infringement. Here's what he says. Family Guy, like the Carol Burnett show, is famous for its pop culture parodies and satirical jabs at celebrities, the studio said. We are surprised that Ms. Burnett, who has made a career of spoofing others on television, would go so far as to sue Family Guy for a simple bit of comedy. So, Notice again, you have to sort of look at this in context. If you just literally look at what's happening here, the literal statement, what they're saying is that we are surprised that Carol Burnett is suing us. And if, and if you just look at it literally that way, it's not, they're not defending themselves. They're not saying it's okay that we did it. They're just saying, oh, we're surprised. We didn't anticipate this fact. It has surprised us. But clearly, from context, you can tell that there's more going on than that. They're, 
This is intended to be a defense of their own behavior. Okay. And given that realistically it's supposed to be a defense of their behavior, it's an ad hominem to quoque fallacy. Okay, let's move on. Um, ad hominem association. Uh, this is the last of the four types of ad hominem fallacy. An ad hominem association is committed when the arguer claims that his opponent or someone involved in the issue, it doesn't necessarily have to be the opponent, is associated with some person or group or event uh, that has negative connotations. Okay, And then the arguer goes on to claim that this supports their own position. Okay, and it's a fallacy if the association isn't relevant. So let's, let's look at an example. Barbara has argued that we should protect the rainforest, since allegedly, if we do not, then we will be causing damage to the environment. Okay, so at this point, we have an opponent, Barbara. Here's an argument. What's the conclusion? We should protect the rainforest. Why? Because if we don't, it's going to damage the environment. So, you know, this person has a position, Okay, and we're going to try and now I'm going to argue against it or the person writing the passage. Let's continue. But my private investigator has just told me that Barbara has been secretly donating money to neo-Nazi groups throughout the region. If that doesn't discredit her position, I don't know what does. So what's the conclusion? Um, my opponent's position is discredited. It's a bad position. Okay, why? Well, there's no data about the position itself. There's nothing like, well, you know, um, a big panel of biologists actually said that the rainforest has nothing to do with the environment and it would be good if we chopped it all down, right? So there's, there's nothing like that. There's nothing that directly addresses the argument. Instead, what we have is the person's pointing out that the, the opponent, Barbara, has an association to this group with serious negative connotations, right, neo-Nazis. And that, that that association by itself is supposed to discredit this person's argument. Now, if you think clearly about this, you'll see that it's irrelevant to whether or not that argument's good. Okay, whether Barbara is a neo-Nazi or a, a Republican or a Democrat or, you know, whatever, doesn't matter what it, that's irrelevant to the argument, right? Either the premises support the conclusion about the rainforest um, or they don't. Okay, now here's where one of the things that I think maybe people get mixed up about. It's clearly maybe relevant to other things, right? You might all of a sudden not think Barbara's a very nice person or whatever. So it's not that it's irrelevant to every possible consideration that you might have when thinking about Barbara. It's just that it's irrelevant to this issue. Okay, that's what makes it a fallacy. So compare it to this, the next uh, different argument. Barbara has argued that, we, that she would be a good choice for mayor since she is unbiased and would help fairly ease racial tensions in our city. Okay, so now Barbara's our opponent. She's made an argument she would be a good choice for mayor. Okay, why? Well, we've got some premises here. Now, I continue on. Um, but you may recall Barbara as the woman who gave money to the neo-Nazi movement in last year's election. So if you look here, this fits the pattern of an ad hominem association perfectly, right? Um, suppose this is my passage here, right? What I'm doing is I'm arguing against Barbara. She's produced an argument. I'm saying we should, you know, not believe her conclusion at all. We should discredit her argument. Why? Well, what do I do? I point out an association between Barbara and uh, a, a bad group, okay? And then act as though that discredits her position. So you might look at that and go, oh, ad hominem association fallacy, because it fits the pattern. Well, it does fit the pattern, definitely. But then you always have to ask yourself the final question. Is it relevant? Is this consideration that is often irrelevant it could, you know, usually associations are irrelevant to the arguments people make, but not always. Is it relevant in this case? Well, it sure is relevant, right? The fact that she um, 
has financially supported neo-Nazi groups, that's really relevant to the conclusion as to whether she'd be a good choice for mayor. Okay, so in this particular case, this is an example of one that fits the pattern of an ad hominem association fallacy. If you go through all of the steps, is there an argument? Yes. What's the conclusion? The conclusion is that my opponent's argument is flawed. What is my premise for that? Well, my premise is just that my um, opponent is associated with a group that has negative connotations. Fits the pattern perfectly for ad hominem association. But you always have to ask yourself that final question. Is it really a fallacy? Is it, these are fallacies of relevance. So is that association relevant to the topic? Okay, in the case of the rainforest, it's not. Okay, whether or not she donated money to neo-Nazis is irrelevant to whether or not the, you know, damaging the rainforest, you know, damages the environment. It's an irrelevant consideration. In this case, it is relevant, right? Whether or not she would be a good chase, a choice for mayor, um, if that's the topic, whether or not she, you know, is pro neo Nazis, that's incredibly relevant. So this would be no fallacy. Okay, final, final point before, um, before I close out this video. You might have noticed that the ad hominem fallacies and the genetic fallacies are very similar. In fact, they're so similar that if you go back and look at some of my examples of the ad hominem genetic fallacy, let me call up one or two of these examples here. Um, um, here's an example I gave of a genetic fallacy. Most of the support for tax cuts uh, for higher tax brackets comes from people who are wealthy. So clearly we should oppose these cuts. Um, at this point, you should look at this and say, oh, wait a minute, that kind of looks like an ad hominem associate, uh, uh, ad hominem circumstantial, right? It's pointing out that this group of people um, has an ulterior motive for a conclusion and is just using that, uh, that fact to argue against their position, okay? So you might ask, ask yourself, what, what's, how can I tell the difference, okay? Here's the answer. Um, all of the ad hominems are a subtype of genetic fallacy. Okay, so they're all genetic, right? Um, well, then how can you tell the difference? Here's how. What you do is once you determine that, okay, it's making some reference to the, the genesis of an argument, right? You ask yourself, does it fit any of the ad hominem patterns? Okay, and if it fits one of those patterns, then that's the fallacy it is. If it's, if it's calling someone a name, and that name is irrelevant to the conclusion, then it's an ad hominem abusive. Okay, if it's um, saying that the person producing the argument has an ulterior motive, then it's ad hominem circumstantial. Okay, so if it fits any of the specific patterns, then that's the right answer. So for instance, this particular argument um, is really a better, uh, um, you know, it would really be better to say that this is ad hominem uh, circumstantial. That's really a better analysis of this passage than genetic, okay? Um, because it fits the pattern of ad hominem circumstantial. Um, if it doesn't, if it's, a, if it's some kind of genetic fallacy, if it's making an appeal to the genesis of an argument, but it doesn't really fit any of the specific ad hominem patterns, then you just say it's a genetic fallacy generally. Okay, so that's how you um, analyze that. Okay, um, so that's it for this video. Um, look forward to the next one.